talking to somebody who worked very closely with Putin in Petersburg back in the 80s. And even then he was obsessed about Ukraine. Hello and welcome to Offscript. My name is Stephen Edgington. Following Vladimir Putin's monologue on Russian history in his interview with Tucker Carlson, should our leaders learn from history? To discuss, I'm joined by the renowned historian Anthony Beaver. Thank you very much, Anthony, for joining us. Do you think that Vladimir Putin's monologue on Russian history was accurate, and what can we learn from it? Uh, Putin's version of history is scrambled, self-contradictory, uh, and in many cases ridiculous. I mean, if one's going to be talking about Russia owning Ukraine from the start, actually it's the other way around. I mean, in fact, Russia should be part of Ukraine uh, if one's going to be talking about Kiev and Rus and all the rest of it. Um, it's like his essay before the year before his invasion of Ukraine. Um, not only is it scrambled and completely ridiculous in many ways, uh, it is uh, sort of based on a curious fantasy, which is not coming from the Soviet side. It's actually coming from the whites in the Russian Civil War. Uh, and it was their ideology of holy uh, Rus, um, Slavic Rus, uh, which gives Russia the idea that they can actually occupy the whole of the Eurasian landmass. Um, and it's, it's a very different one. I mean, when you've got to look at the Kremlin or look at his palace on the Black Sea, uh, there's hardly anything to do with the Soviet Union there. It is actually czarist entirely. So you've just written a book about um, the Russian Civil War, the period between 1917 and 1921. Do you think that this idea of imperialism into Ukraine and perhaps even to other Eastern European countries, the Baltic countries, uh, Poland and so on, it comes from the Tsarist imperialism, or is there also a bit of Leninist kind of expansionism in terms of his uh, wars that he tried to fight in the early 1920s but was famously stopped by the Poles? Well, I, ironically, of course, it was um, Lenin who Putin was criticizing for the whole of the problem in Ukraine, which actually is slightly ridiculous. Um, yes, Lenin said, oh, um, we mustn't be seen as Russian chauvinists, and therefore uh, we will have a certain amount of sort of, you know, independent uh, self-determination and all the rest of it. Um, but the idea was, of course, that um, they would then be retaken over uh, from a purely communist Bolshevik point of view. Um, the real uh, idea, though, as I was saying, was coming from this sort of this white idea. This is what Dugin, Alexander Dugin, is sort of believing, you know, that um, it should be uh, Russian, uh, the Eurasian landmass should be Russian from Vladivostok all the way to Dublin um, or, or Portugal, I don't know. Uh, it's, it is preposterous, but at the same time, this idea that they have a moral superiority, uh, they don't have the corruption of the West and all the rest of it, um, for some reason sort of still has a link to the past. But, you know, whether or not this is purely ideological or whether it is a justification for um, the military expansionism, for the uh, re reconstruction of the Russian Empire, um, is very much open today. I, I think part of it is this idea of pride and humiliation that Putin obviously feels. And he famously said that the collapse of the Soviet Union was one of the worst tragedies or the worst tragedy of the 20th century. So do you feel that he's trying to restore Russian honour? Oh yes, very much so. And Putin was acutely aware of this. I mean, it was interesting, I was talking to somebody who worked very closely with Putin uh, in Petersburg back in the, uh, uh, back in the 80s. Um, and even then he was obsessed about Ukraine. So this one does go back a very long way. Uh, and it is true of the way that um, he was uh, obsessed about it, but nobody really took it seriously. And we made this mistake before. We made it in the 1930s. The British and the French couldn't imagine that anybody would want to have another war after the First World War. Um, and again, we thought nobody would ever really want to have in their right mind. But this is the trouble about democratic um, a confirmation bias. We insist on looking um, at the world through our own boots, or if you like, through our own eyes, um, and fail to understand the mentality of um, dictators, which often um, doesn't work in their own self-interest. Putin also made this absurd 
comment about Poland and that Poland started the Second World War somehow, which is absolutely ridiculous. I'm sure you can talk about that in a moment. Um, but this issue of Poland is fascinating and Polish history and Poland's relationship with Russia, obviously for um, for an entire, almost over, I think 120 years, it was under the Russian kind of czar, mm -hmm. czarist rule until 1918. And as I said earlier, in 1921, uh, the Poles defeated the, the Red Army in, in the Battle of Warsaw. And this humiliation was something that Stalin felt that he had to correct later on, obviously. And so I just wonder why you think Putin is, do you think Putin is still obsessed in Poland in the same way that previous Lush, Russian leaders have been? Oh, yes. I mean, there is an enormous visceral hatred of the Poles. Uh, the memories going back to the Polish occupation of Moscow and uh, that humiliation. Um, without any real recognition of what Russia has done to Poland over the years. Uh, Stalin at one moment at Yalta actually acknowledged this, uh, but then of course was proceeding to crush Poland uh, even in an even more humiliating fashion uh, in 1945, which he, certainly, which he certainly did. Talking about the Russian Civil War, obviously your book is, is, is uh, your most recent book is about that. What do you think the impact and legacy of that war is today on Russia and the rest of Europe? It was huge. I mean, we have always thought, as most first German and then also British historians, recognize the First World War as the original catastrophe of the 20th century. But in fact, it was the Russian Civil War which was the most influential because of the destruction, the brutality, the cruelty, I mean, almost sadism in many uh, aspects. Um, it created a, a vicious circle of fear throughout Europe and beyond. Uh, and this was the rise of fascism, uh, was to a very large degree accelerated by the, the horrors of the Russian Civil War. So we see the Spanish Civil War and large degree even many aspects of the Second World War, which of course was a combination of different conflicts. Um, it was a very much sort of um, a multipolar uh, conflict in, in, in many ways. Uh, not in the sort of way we've tended to see if it's sort of freedom versus um, totalitarianism. Um, but um, it then influenced, of course, then the Cold War. And in fact, the Second Cold War, as one could describe it today, is really just a change of axis. And in, in many ways, it all goes back really to uh, the Russian Civil War, which really uh, defined the pattern of the 20th century. And that war started in 1917, following the February Revolution, as a result of the First World War and the First World War's impact on Russia. Now, it may be too optimistic to say that the war in Ukraine could lead to a similar style revolution, but I'd like you to comment on those comparisons potentially. Well, I think that it was not so much, it wasn't the February Revolution, of course, it was the communist coup d'etat of October, uh, which really triggered the Russian, the Russian Civil War. Um, there was going to be conflict of some form and some sort of chaos, but uh, uh, that was going to really uh, lead to the horrors that, uh, that followed, there's no doubt. Um, but the way that um, all of these other conflicts sort of followed on um, across Europe um, was hard to define in terms of uh, when one gets to the Second World War. I mean, there one sees that the effects of the uh, redrawing of frontiers at uh, Versailles during that particular period were bound to lead to certain ethnic conflicts or um, the, the problems over frontiers, which would have been a some form of European conflict, but nothing like what we saw. But that came about purely because of uh, Hitler having an obsessive uh, hatred and determination to create a race war um, against the Soviet Union, um, which was really what gave it its, uh, its character and its uh, totally destructive character. But in terms of the impact of the First World War mm. on Russia and that leading to a revolution mm. toppling the Tsar, is there a comparison to be made between the, the current war in Ukraine, the impact that that's having on Russia, and whether there could be a ten potentially a similar style revolution against Putin because of a, a result of that war? I don't think so, um, certainly not the present state. I mean, things would have to get a lot, lot worse in Russia uh, before you get it. But also, one has to remember that a revolution only comes about largely because of the collapse of confidence of the ruling party, the ruling class. 
uh, and the Kremlin is not in any position or any um, frame of mind um, to concede in any way. Uh, and if Putin is uh, overthrown in a palace revolution or a palace coup, uh, we're much more likely to see a great, a hard, a hardliner, Patrushev or whoever, certainly not now Prigozhin, as we know. Um, but one of the dangers for Putin, of course, is that he's created so many different uh, security organizations, some 27 altogether, um, that there is a chance uh, that they too might be feeling fairly nervous, you know, we're about to be next. Um, so to predict the future is uh, very, very hard. But one thing I, I'm fairly confident of, it's not going to come through a street revolution like in February 1917. Now, you have written uh, military history books about various different conflicts and wars. Mm. And I wonder what conflict or war you think this current one in Ukraine most reflects in terms of the style of battle. All uh, wars are certain hybrids. I mean, you know, you take the Spanish Civil War, which almost started off like something like out of, something out of the Mexican Revolution, um, and was like the Second World War by the end, uh, having passed through sort of First World War and all the rest of it. Um, and we're, what we've been seeing in uh, Ukraine is also fascinating, that it starts off with a, an armoured thrust on Kiev, um, and um, people predicting that's the end of the tank. And what we see, we now, you know, the Ukrainians desperate for tanks because they're the only things, the modern tanks, are the only things which perhaps might be proof against uh, drones or most of the drones and so forth. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, we are seeing huge developments uh, and uh, changes. So it's very hard to make a comparison. Uh, and anyway, um, I always feel that sort of, you know, political parallels or uh, historical parallels are very dangerous indeed. I mean, people always make comparisons instinctively, particularly politicians and the media, uh, to the Second World War to emphasize the importance or the scale of a crisis, uh, but also for leaders to make them sound either Churchillian or Rooseveltian um, and sort of, you know, slightly get themselves on a pedestal. But uh, um, it's usually very, very dangerous because look at the effects of comparing 9-11 to Pearl Harbor, uh, puts you into a mentality of state-on-state -state warfare rather than dealing with something which was uh, essentially a security problem. Um, so uh, one has to be careful. But in uh, Ukraine, uh, yes, we've seen even elements of the First World War. We've seen elements of Star Wars. I mean, one, one can see the whole sort of panoply of the 20th, uh, uh, 20th and 21st centuries. Are there any lessons that Putin or even Zelensky can learn from previous Russian, Ukrainian, Polish leaders such as Lenin, the Tsar, Pilsudski I'm thinking of? Well, the trouble about uh, Putin is, of course, no country is as much a prisoner of their past as Russia. Um, we see Putin making all of the mistakes that they made in the Second World War, whether it was like uh, the way they sent their tanks into Berlin, um, thinking that um, that would be easy, but I mean, had huge losses. Um, one seen the way that they, um, of the invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968, where uh, the mm, uh, ambassador in Prague said, oh, they're waiting to welcome you as uh, liberators and all the rest of it. Uh, and they were soon out of uh, fuel and um, being spat at and uh, hated by the local population. So Russia has often repeated its own mistakes. It sometimes learns rapidly from them, as it did in the Second World War. And I'm afraid we're certainly seeing the way that the Russian army has started to learn from some of its appalling mistakes um, in the earlier fighting in Ukraine. Uh, how far this goes, whether this will be enough to improve the morale of Russian troops, uh, certainly won't do much to improve the behavior of Russian troops, which is simply terrifying. Um, but we are seeing evolution uh, during the course of the fighting. Now, you have written many books about the Second World War. What do you think the impact of what the Russians call the Great Patriotic War is today on their sense of national identity? Well, it's still very large, there's no doubt about it, but much more for the older generation rather than for the young. Um, yes, there are obviously sort of fascist elements amongst the young in part terms of the way that sort of, you know, Putin youth and uh, other organisations and groups like that still take it quite seriously. Uh, but with the way one saw uh, a vast exodus of the young, educated young from the cities, particularly from Petersburg and uh, Moscow uh, and other city cities wanting to get out and have nothing to do with this war, um, shows that there's one thing one can never do and that's generalise about 
about Russia. Um, there's no way the the different nationalities, the different classes, and all the rest of it. Uh, Russia cannot be described in simple terms. But Putin seems to be obsessed with this issue of Nazis, neo-Nazis, fascists, and everyone in Russia seems to be an anti-fascist in that sense, rather yes. than what you just said. Well, it's true, but I mean, um, at the same time, they won't recognise these similarities. Um, I mean, it took Vasily Grossman in his great novel of uh, Life and Fate uh, to point out the real similarities between Nazism and, uh, and Stalinism, um, for which, of course, you know, it, uh, that was the end of his career, not surprisingly. But um, it's, it's something which in Russia they refuse to, they are the goodies from the Second World War, we are the ones who liberated Europe. Um, and anything which contradicts that uh, is completely crushed. I mean, one of the, Medinsky, who was the, the great ideologue advising um, uh, Putin, who's an absolute idiot of the worst order. Um, he was the one where a few years ago, Putin spent this vast fortune on this um, movie called Panfilov and his 28 men uh, to sort of create a myth about these Kazakhs uh, helping to defend Moscow and uh, a general, uh, and that 28 of them managed to destroy a, uh, a whole uh, Nazi panzer division. Uh, and yet it was known, and it was actually the head of the Russian state archives was sacked uh, because he said, yes, but we know that this was completely invented by a journalist, I mean, with Kosnyazvetsa, with the Red Star um, paper. Um, he, well, he was sacked, um, but the movie still went ahead. And of course, it was regarded by some as holy writ. And Medinsky said, anybody who doubts this story, even if it's not true, is below slime. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is the attitude, you, you cannot disbelieve uh, official orthodox uh, belief. And this use of the orthodox church um, is simply astonishing. I mean, Duralites are now, there are now icons showing Prigozhin as a saint uh, holding the sledgehammer with which um, they regarded as their method of uh, discipline to kill anybody who deserted. It's so interesting that the impact of the Orthodox Church on, on war in Russia, mm -hmm. and as, as we know, the Soviets tried to destroy the church and you know they're very hardcore atheists and then when they were invaded in Operation Barbarossa um, those rules became a bit more lax and I think Stalin recognized that he had to there were other things that he had to sort of tap into in terms of patriotism people's um, relationship with God in order to motivate them to fight in order to help their morale so how have how do you assess this this idea of using the church in Russia to try and sort of boost people's morale well, this is what Putin is doing. And I mean, you know, you have uh, the, the priests uh, blessing nuclear missiles. You have the priests, uh, you know, blessing recruits going away. But I mean, for many of them, um, religion in Russia um, is very intense in sort of certain uh, groups and among certain, uh, in certain parts. Um, sometimes in the countryside it's there, but this is in many ways, I think, a reaction to the past. Um, but I mean, I don't think this is this isn't going to make any of the uh, soldiers fight any better uh, than when one sees photographs of them kneeling in front of the czar before going off to battle uh, with the czar holding up an icon. Um, things have not changed very much in that particular way. How has the war impacted you as an historian studying Russia? Uh, in terms of access to historical archives and so on. And I know that you've um, written your you know, excellent book about Stalingrad and, and you had a brilliant access in, it was in the 1990s sort of to the Russian archives then just after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I just wonder if you can assess some of the sort of um, those differences and changes in, in accessibility to Russian documents and so on throughout the last, I don't know, 30 or 40 years. Well, my great fear two years ago as um, Russian tanks uh, were heading for Kiev was the Ukrainian archives because they are absolute goldmine for any uh, historians who may be thwarted in the Russian archives. Okay, that's a very selfish um, attitude, if you like, in a way, but I was uh, horrified by the fear that, you know, the, one of the first things they'd do would be not necessarily they could destroy quite a bit, but also just to basically take them away and make sure that they weren't accessible anymore. Um, but this is the way that, of course, they want to control history. They also wanted to, and the way we've seen them loot, looting uh, so many of the uh, historic, uh, not just archives, but of course, uh, uh, symbols, um, even whether it's the body of Potemkin or uh, uh, anything like that, um, there has been the most appalling um, 
basically a sort of cultural rape of the country. One last question on the Civil War, just a sort of more sort of nerdy question, but is it possible for the whites to have won that war? No, I don't think so. Um, partly for a, well, a whole range of reasons. One, the, the, the whites had no coherent ideology. They were a, a, a strange mix of, uh, of Cossacks, white imperialists uh, from the Tsarist army, uh, and some uh, basically sort of, you know, central and right-wing um, socialists. Um, and uh, A, they couldn't get their act together. Uh, they were incredibly incompetent and corrupt. Uh, but above all, they also managed to put off their potential allies of the Poles, the Estonians, and the Finns, um, simply because of their imperialist, Russian imperialist attitude. So the, I don't think there was any chance. And also, of course, they didn't have uh, internal lines, which was a great advantage of the uh, Soviets, that they had a coherent um, organization. They also had a coherent um, area of uh, defense and uh, potential for counterattack, which is what they did. Um, was that because of Trotsky? Well, Trotsky and the Red Army, yes, but it was also geographically that they had that great mass of um, central Russia um, and uh, the north and the main country, uh, main cities. So they had the manpower and the factories. Uh, but also when, for example, they were able to concentrate their armies against Kolchak in Siberia uh, and then bring them back to defeat Denikin coming up from the south in 1919. Let's talk about the impact that the Second World War has on British identity, we've talked about how it's impacted Russian identity. How do you think we view that war today? Um, I think and I hope with a lot more open-mindedness rather than, uh, if you like, the patriotic myth of the 1950 movies and so forth. I mean, they weren't that bad, those 1950 movies in comparison to some of them and um, in comparison to some of the distortions of history we've seen in um, recent uh, movies coming out of Hollywood. Um, but I think that our knowledge of the past and of certainly of the Second World War um, is so bad amongst the, sort of the general population uh, and especially amongst the young today, it's terrifying. I mean, even a number of years ago when the BBC did a series on um, Auschwitz, an important series on Auschwitz by Lawrence Rees, um, they were finding that many, many people thought that Auschwitz was a brand of beer. I mean, they had no idea. A, about even about the Holocaust, and yet people say that there's sort of too much emphasis on the Holocaust in history, um, but B, about who was who and on which side and all the rest of it. So um, uh, the idea of the sort of the chance of two world wars and one world cup and you know things like that, uh, which we had say in the 70s and 80s when uh, Britain was suffering from a severe inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis Germany, um, even that, I think, has gone, and certainly uh, more recently, I think that um, there is a tremendous sort of doubt in, or a, a decline, if you like, in national self-confidence. Um, and I didn't, we're, we're not hearing, we had a bit of it during Brexit or whatever about sort of, you know, our role in the Second World War, we saved Europe, which is all r rubbish, but uh, uh, yes, certainly. If we had not held on in 1940, it's true, Hitler, it's a one moment when Hitler could have won the war completely. Um, but, you know, apart from that, um, our role um, was, was, was not bad, uh, that's certainly true. Um, but, you know, there were some dark marks too, but uh, uh, some dark passages as well. But um, on the whole, it was, yes, it was good, but that doesn't mean that, um, you know, that's a justification for us today, and we can't rely on history um, any more than uh, Putin saying that it was the Red Army which liberated Europe, uh, but actually also enslaved Europe. Just on that latter point, um, mm. generally that leaders should learn from history or obsess over history in the same way that Putin has. Is there a way that our politicians should, should interact with history from, from the past? Well, they should certainly learn the lessons of the past. But I mean, let's face it, Bismarck rightly said, you know, the, um, <coughs> uh, the only thing we learn from history is that nobody learns from history. And I'm afraid leaders don't learn from history. Uh, they, unfortunately, will tend to use history um, simply to justify a particular policy. Uh, and when we hear echoes of the Second World War, uh, going back to what I was saying, you know, this is when they are trying to sound a bit Churchillian uh, or to emphasize how um, important something is or a crisis is. But actually, um, it's not. And the Second World War was not like any other war. And so it's about the worst thing to start comparing things to.
There's a famous poll, I think, from a few years ago from the BBC in which they asked young people who was Winston Churchill and so on, was he a fictional character? And many of them genuinely believed that he, he, was, a, he was a fictional character, which is just incredible, really. Yes, we are, though, about the only country in Europe, apart from Albania and Iceland, I think. I think Neil Ferguson pointed it out, um, where we gave up the um, compulsory teaching of history from the age of 13 or 14 or whatever it was. Um, so uh, I'm afraid that's rather bound to be the case. Do you think in terms of teaching history, we obsess too much, particularly in, in secondary school, over historiography and sources and analysing that sort of thing, rather than, I don't know, more kind of, um, I suppose, popular history or kind of thinking about the myths in a way that perhaps in the 80s and 70s and 60s in terms of education we would have done? Um, I, I mean, just from my own personal experience of studying history in school, um, I know that we, it just seemed to be endless analysis of like, you know, this source A and source B and compare them and so on. Well, I think that's sort of, if you like, playing at history. I mean, giving the idea to children that sort of somehow they could be historians too, um, without any context, without any background. I mean, the problem is that they will jump from the Tudors to uh, the Second World War without any idea of what happened in between. Um, I know it was sort of regarded as sort of rather uh, top-down approach and old-fashioned and all the rest of it. But I mean, I remember as a child where you had those sort of panels going all around the um, class, uh, you know, showing the kings and queens all the way through. Well, it was regarded the kings and queens, so that's elitist. Um, but the trouble about kings and all the advantage about kings and queens is rather like, say, architectural periods or whatever. Uh, one can see how things have developed over time and particularly uh, with the way that periods were often associated with monarchs in the past. And they were, of course, influential in that way. I mean, the way that of Henry VIII or whoever it might be. Uh, and you also saw sort of the way that that things changed in terms of dress and therefore culture um, over that period of time. Nowadays, nobody knows what a century is, what is a decade. Um, they cannot understand the passage of time uh, over the last thousand years um, to realize, you know, where something is ancient history. For them, the Battle of Alamein is ancient history, um, but have got no idea sort of what, what is sort of modern, what is, what is past. Let's talk again about um, the relationship between Britain and the Second World War and how it's changed through the ages since the war ended. Now, you mentioned in the 1950s there were these kind of patriotic films uh, idealising heroes from, from that war, particularly British films. I mean, I, my dad was always showing them when I was growing up and I loved some of them. Um, uh, but, but as you say, more, perhaps more recently, people have become more ignorant of the war as uh, Second World War veterans uh, are dying out. I, I suspect there are a couple of them left, right, but, but, but they really sort of are becoming more rare. Um, so how, how have attitudes changed throughout, let's say, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s? And I know that particularly particularly in, let's say, the 60s, I think younger people weren't really interested in the Second World War in the same way that the people who'd lived through it were. Well, I think there was sort of genuine pride in sort of the late 40s or whatever, but there was also a feeling of depression and exhaustion. I mean, let's face it, uh, as the Duke of Wellington said, you know, the, um, only, a, uh, only a battle won is sort of close to the horror of battle defeated. And I mean, we had won and we were bankrupt after the end of the Second World War. Um, so therefore, we tended to rely that much more on pride and therefore on our reputation as a result of the Second World War. Um, but our, our history, therefore, was one whereby I think that we sort of tended to cling to the past uh, more than we needed to during that particular period. It was sort of a mental crutch. Um, and I don't think that it changed hugely until one got, say, to the 60s, when, of course, you started to get sort of counterculture and that uh, development and then the Vietnam War and so forth, that uh, the whole idea that, you know, America was a force for good and had, say, helped save Europe or did save Europe uh, in the process of its liberation. Um, so politics and... Um, basically sort of uh, cultural change are gonna start making huge differences. And we saw that during that particular period. And I mean, in fact, then history became a, an absolute joke for some, uh, let's say the Carnaby Street idea of sort of wearing, um, wearing uh, uniforms as a joke rather than as a sort of um, element of pride. Uh, all of these uh, reflected the, uh, the changes. Um, and then you have other er eras. I mean, 
one has to remember that sort of attitudes towards the armed forces changed largely as a result of uh, Northern Ireland because, of course, um, no soldiers, therefore, or no servicemen could actually wear uniforms on the street. Um, and it looked as if sort of the armed forces had disappeared. And therefore, at that stage, there was also a separation between the civilian population um, and, and the armed forces. And, of course, the armed forces in many ways represented history uh, in, their own, in their own particular way. So um, all, all of these changes are going to have a, a huge effect over time. Let's talk about some of the myths that have formed in Britain, particularly around the Second World War. And also, um, perhaps this is a question you, you won't know too much about, but I hope you do. Um, could you also compare us to France and how France's reaction to that war changed over the years? Because they obviously had a very different experience to us. So, yeah, the, the first idea of myths and then perhaps a bit about France. Well, um, our myths um, have always been, uh, should we say, powerful ones like every country. Uh, we didn't have an international version, of course, of the history of the Second World War. And that's only come much more recently. A lot of it came... Yeah, which was a good thing in the way that, for example, we got many German historians coming to British universities and so forth, and we had therefore had much more of a sort of multinational approach uh, towards the history. In terms of myths, one of the great myths that people talk about is that um, we, we say that the war was fought originally for moral reasons, whereas there is an argument from some historians that it was fought for more practical reasons in terms of saving the empire or more sort of geopolitical reasons and so on. Um, whereas, you know, there is this idea that we fought that war because we, we were there to save the Jews or something like that, whereas perhaps that, that isn't true. Um, the other myths people talk about are around Dunkirk and the small boats and the impact that that had and so on. Um, perhaps the impact of Britain more generally on the war, um, maybe we were more of a minor player in terms of the other roles of the other countries. So those are a few of the myths that people People talk about? Well, I think that the reason why we declared war um, had at that stage nothing to do with empire. Um, and once, of course, the war then developed, and particularly when it became a world war, uh, then it did have much more to do with empire and defensive empire and so forth. Um, but when one looks at the circumstances, once you had the Nazi Soviet pact, uh, war became almost impossible to avoid. I mean, there's the old historian's argument that nothing is inevitable, but in fact, it's, it is very, very hard to imagine how you could have avoided it at that particular point. Uh, and in fact, that would have gone certainly from the moment that the uh, Nazis occupied Prague and had obviously broke their um, declarations at and agreements at Munich uh, in 1938. So uh, we find ourselves actually fighting a, a, a European war at that particular stage. Um, we obviously get empire, the rest of the dominions and the other dominions and so forth in uh, the British Empire at that particular stage to declare war as well. So it does therefore tend towards a world war even at that particular, even at that particular point. But I mean, in terms of myths and um, the way that we saw it, uh, of course, we were going to look at it in, in more moral, or we are going to describe it in more moral terms. Uh, no, we didn't go to war uh, to save the Jews, but at the same time, um, one of our feelings that I think in, in fairly general terms um, was that um, the Nazis were uniquely evil because of their persecution. But we had no idea, of course, of the mass uh, killings until really 1941. Um, and then 1942 and the Inter-Allied Declaration uh, on um, the uh, Holocaust. Um, all of that was were, were developments from the... Uh, original war started in Europe. Um, for the French, of course, it was different because their humiliation in 1940 uh, was uh, a profound national shock to the whole psyche, to the whole uh, mentality. And they tried to convince themselves that actually it was unfair and it was then it was the British who pushed us into the war. Um, again, I'm generalizing, of course, there were um, uh, those, the brave ones and the uh, really patriotic ones who believed that we, they should still fight on and all the rest of it, who wanted to have nothing to do with Pétain and Vichy uh, and all the rest of it. Uh, 
But what is much more interesting is the way that after the, the Second World War, when you have such deep wounds in the national psyche, you have to bind them up with myths. And of course, the great myth was of La France Résistante and all of de Gaulle's speeches in this particular, uh, in this particular way. But as Anthony Eden rightly pointed out in that great film of Le Chagrin La Pitié, um, he said, we, the British, have no grounds or justification in trying to judge the French. We were not occupied, and we don't know how we would have behaved. And that is certainly true. I mean, I didn't, I'm sure that Britain would have not, not been able really to get one fighting. Um, Churchill, if he'd still been in power, assuming that we had been overrun, yes, would have wanted to continue the fight from the Dominions um, to get the fleet to Canada and, and so forth, uh, and to carry on. But, uh, you know, you cannot predict what would have happened in a totally hypothetical situation. No, you can't. But it, but it is interesting that in France in the 1930s, they did seem to have far more political chaos than we had in Britain. Um, they had the Popular Front, and, and I know that Patan and others were very uh, worried about communists taking over and, and um, saw the kind of Nazis coming in and all collaboration with the Nazis as perhaps a solution to that or sort of, you know, better of two evils. So perhaps there is a bit of a distinction between um, the way that British politicians felt in the 1930s in terms of confidence and so on in their nation and they didn't feel that we were heading towards the same kind of political crisis as um, they did in France. Well, some certainly did. I mean, you know, there were um, a number of, uh, within the Conservative Party, a number of sort of sympathisers uh, with um, Hitler and with Mussolini and so forth. Um, you know, um, uh, my grandmother, who was the observer correspondent in Italy, was sacked by Garvin uh, because she'd criticised Mussolini. Um, you know, so one can't uh, be, um, predict uh, things automatically uh, along the lines of uh, uh, political loyalties. Uh, and I think this is one of the greatest examples of the Second World War, that in fact the one thing you must never do uh, is automatically to assume um, standards of behaviour entirely by by people's uh, either political or social or any other form religious background. Now I know you mentioned before we filmed this interview that Macron is thinking of doing these huge celebrations around um, the 80th anniversary of D-Day. How do contemporary French politicians think about D-Day? Do they see it as them being rescued by the British and the Americans. And I know that uh, if you go to um, Les Invalides in France, in Paris, and, and look at their museum around the Second World War, they're very insistent on saying, um, you know, we were, we were involved in D-Day, de Gaulle was there. Um, uh, there was this really funny chart about um, how many troops were in D-Day and where they all came from. And I think it's like 100,000 British Americans and so on. And then it says in the tiny little bar chart, 177 French or something like that. I can't remember the exact numbers. Um, but so how, how, how how is D-Day viewed in France today? Well, of course, D-Day, uh, when one sees uh, French, the history of that particular period, it was vital for their myth of national regeneration um, that they had to be there and take part in it. Um, that is why, you know, the Leclerc's Deuxième DB, the Second Armoured Division, had to be brought back, especially from North Africa, uh, to take part. And that was allowed by Eisenhower to lead the liberation of Paris. Um, and I think that that was absolutely right. If it hadn't been that, um, then there would have been the communist takeover in France. And one has to remember quite how close France was to civil war in the summer of 1944. Um, so I think those decisions were uh, entirely true. In fact, uh, General Patton at one particular point was asked by journalists, you know, what did he, how did he rate the French resistance? And uh, for once, Patton actually came up with quite a subtle reply, which was um, uh, better than expected, but less than advertised. Um, and I think that was probably overall true, you know, but I think they still played a major part in Brittany, uh, in one or two other areas in the way that they delayed the sort of reinforcements coming from the south towards the uh, invasion area. But for the French overall, um, there is, I think, general, um, genuine um, gratitude uh, for the Allies. And, you know, even the Americans, where the French have a very, very uh, mixed uh, view of the Americans, you know, that's a real love-hate relationship. Um, when it's anything to do with D-Day, um, then the French are sort of entirely pro-American, there's no doubt about it. Uh, there are pockets, of course, which aren't, where they suffered very badly, I mean, in Normandy, because of the bombing campaign. Uh, which was needed in a way where they actually destroyed uh, towns 
what's called putting the, putting the city in the street, um, so as to block the roads so that uh, German uniform, reinforcements couldn't come in. But I mean, you know, this was part of an essential plan to make sure that the uh, invasion was not crushed before we'd got sufficient troops ashore. But all, all, all in all, Macron, though, interestingly, wants to make a big effort this particular year in the 80th anniversary uh, as a symbol, in fact, over Ukraine. Um, it is to show that the unity of the Allies in 1944 prevailed and it will prevail again and all the rest of it, uh, which, of course, is quite useful because um, sort of Macron has been rather uh, unpredictable when it's come to uh, relations with Russia and how well he can persuade Putin to do things uh, in a slightly less aggressive way. But, um, you know, one should only sort of, you know, welcome this, um, that he is making a, a, a plans to make a big effort this year. In terms of Britain's role in the Second World War, you mentioned 1940 as being that very crucial year, probably our greatest contribution to that war. And of course, we broke the Enigma Codes and, and that had a huge impact as well. Um, the bombing campaign in Germany and so on. But there is this accusation or the stereotype, I suppose, that British generals were pretty useless at fighting battles and, 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 and things like that. Do you think that that's accurate? And if so, why? I think that there was a, a large element still of amateurishness in the British Army. Uh, the Royal Navy was tended to be much more professional. There were certain parts of the British Army uh, artillery engineers which were uh, very professional, but the old sort of regimental system was still um, a, uh, a descendant, if you like, of the, the gentlemanly way of making war in the past. Um, and therefore, generals quite often needed to be sacked. Um, the Americans were far more ruthless about sacking generals. Uh, that's certainly true. Um, and, but even Patton said afterwards that uh, actually they were overzealous in sacking generals, uh, quite often before they'd even had a chance ready to prove themselves or to sort out the initial problems. Um, and it's true, I think, in, in, in many armies. Um, but we did not have the professionalism, obviously, of um, the German army. Um, and it took a long time to even learn lessons from the Germans and their way of uh, um, preparing uh, NCOs and others, you know, to take command uh, at a moment of crisis because our rather class-ridden system um, meant that, you know, NCOs had kept the soldiers um, well disciplined, um, but they were never in a position really to sort of take over uh, an officer's job at a moment of crisis, and that was that was one of the weaknesses. I know that Alan Brooks says in his diaries that um, perhaps the quality of, Brit of British generals declined because so many good men were killed in the First World War. Mm -hmm. And that's one argument that he comes up with. Maybe you could comment on that. And also this issue of morale. Was that one of the things, was that one of our disadvantages in the Second World War, as it were, um, that sort of afflicted Britain perhaps more than Germany and other nations? When you look, look to Egypt or look to Singapore, I'm thinking, where our morale just really was on a different level to, to the Axis. Um, yes, it certainly was on a different level to a large degree, and there were reasons for that. One has to remember that um, the whole question of Dunkirk and abandoning the vast men, um, quantity of weapons and so forth uh, had a disastrous knock-on effect. Uh, it meant we were so short of weapons that none of the uh, factories could actually change, retool, or bring in new uh, and better uh, equipment. Uh, and this is especially true of the tanks. And this is why uh, in North Africa we were always outgunned. Um, the Germans had much better tanks. You know, it was real Vorsprung durch Technik of its period. Um, and uh, as I say, we were outgunned and outfought. Uh, and that, of course, had a desperate effect on uh, morale. And it was only really towards the end of the war uh, that we'd, we'd, we'd managed to get our act together. So uh, it took a long time. But that was, that, funny enough, a, a largely a, a knock-on effect from Dunkirk. Who, in your view, were some of our better and more competent generals? I know that a lot of people say that Alan Brooke himself was an excellent strategist. And uh, Bill Slim is someone else who com comes to mind. Who, who would you who would you say? 
Well, um, slim. Um, I mean, you know, in the the very very top. I mean, Mount Montgomery. Montgomery was very good as a trainer of troops, um, but he was totally or he was self overrated, if you like, uh, in terms of what he achieved. I mean, at Alamein, um, the back of uh, Rommel's armies had more or less already been broken, largely by the RAF and the uh, Navy um, stopping the supplies coming coming in. Um, and uh, so, you know, the victory at Alamein was, okay, for propaganda reasons, had to be uh, exaggerated and uh, uh, greatly sort of blown up. But by the end, of course, with the combination of the Americans coming in and Operation Torch, um, then there was a real effect. And uh, in fact, more prisoners were sort of taken at Tunis than uh, uh, so called at Stalingrad. Actually, that. Un <laughs> That actually does that figure, which has often been quoted, uh, doesn't take into effect all the other ones who've been captured before Stalingrad actually fell. So um, it was one of the examples of misleading propaganda, uh, of which there are, let's face it, quite a few. Yes. Talking again about Britain's contribution in the Second World War, where, where do you think that we contributed most compared to the other Allied nations? Um, well, the Navy was, of course, vital from the point of view of the Battle of the Atlantic, because without winning the Battle of the Atlantic, uh, we wouldn't really have been able to mount D-Day. Um, if the submarines had been able to attack the invasion fleet and all the rest of it. Um, the, the bombing war, well, that's a very, still a very, very controversial area. Um, in many ways, it was a second front as far as um, Stalin was concerned, and I think Stalin knew because it forced the uh, Germans to bring back uh, all of their anti-aircraft guns really from the Russian front, and they were also the best anti-tank guns, the 88 millimeters, uh, to bring them back to uh, Germany. So that actually had a, an extraordinary effect. Funny enough, many of our greatest contributions actually were not necessarily intended in the way they were planned at the time, but um, the fact was they worked in that, in, that particular, um, in that particular way. But I think Churchill was well aware of this, and so was Stalin, um, even if it had not been the original um, idea. Uh, we also, I think, um, you know, certainly, I mean, in the Far East, we didn't have such a, uh, obviously, a very uh, great part to play, except Burma, which was an appalling fight and battle. Um, one would never have wanted to, to have volunteered to be there, I don't think. Um, but was, I didn't think, did show really the genius, in a way, uh, of Slim's uh, leadership and one of the best examples going. But we're also uh, well aware that there was, um, the Second World War had a curious effect on senior commanders, that uh, uh, many of them were still perfectly modest and all the rest of it, but some of them, like General Mark Clark or, um, or certainly Douglas MacArthur, but also Montgomery, um, became obsessed with uh, uh, public figure and uh, public image. I mean, Mark Clark had more um, than 50 people in his uh, public relations department, uh, and they were all instructed to make sure that they only took uh, one side, his profile, his left profile, was, uh, uh, of which he was very proud. Uh, and um, he felt that um, this made him look rather imperial and Roman or whatever, and he was known as Marcus Aurelius Clarkus by his uh, officers uh, because also of his determination to conquer Rome. But it, it, it was very strange that here were these characters who in 1939, or in the case of the American 1941, nobody had heard of any of them, and suddenly they became almost film stars and major figures because the newsreels and the uh, journalists could only interview the commanders uh, and focus on the commanders because other, anything else would be giving away um, secrets to the enemy. Again, coming back to this issue of, of changing attitudes towards history, you mentioned Churchill uh, and Stalin, for example. Um, Recently, there have been questions over Churchill's um, role in the Bengal famine, um, although not, you know, I'm sure that those, that those questions have been around for a long time as well, to be fair. Um, even since, I think, Leo Amory, Leo Amory at the time, who's you know, not a great friend of Churchill, was very critical of him, mm -hmm. for example. But also more contemporary attitudes to Churchill have, I think, become more personal, particularly around this idea that he was a racist, he was a colonialist, and so on. And actually, many younger people think that he was more of an enemy and an evil person than a sort of hero. And that really Really has been a shift, I think, in the last 20 years, perhaps. Yes. Um, can you comment on that? Yes. Um, I think one of the problems here, of course, is that uh, <coughs> the younger generation um, cannot accept context. 
Um, and I mean, let's face it, Churchill was an Edwardian figure and he hadn't changed in that particular way. Uh, many believed in eugenics of that particular period. They were racist, I mean, there's no doubt about it. They did believe in British uh, superiority. Um, and, you know, Churchill was a racist, but I mean, so were many of um, his contemporary, contemporaries. Um, uh, that was the way things were. Uh, I'm not suggesting you're trying to defend it or anything like that, but you have to understand what the mentality was at the time. So where they were in America, so where they were throughout Europe as well. So there was nothing particularly um, uniquely evil in that particular way about their individual character. Uh, the trouble with Churchill was that he had this totally romantic vision of the British Raj in India um, and then felt that sort of any attempt to create independence or obtain independence uh, was sort of treason in one particular way without in, in any way putting himself into the shoes, boots or whatever of Indians um, who even though uh, you know the British uh, occupation or the British conquest uh, brought um, some advantages, it also brought uh, huge disadvantages. And above all, uh, they would prefer to have their own leaders, however badly led they might have been, um, rather than a totally foreign culture um, taking them over, which is perfectly natural. We would have felt the same way, and um, certainly the Saxons felt that. Um, you know, when the Normans took over took over England. But I mean, the trouble was, as I say, Churchill was a child of his particular generation. What do you make of the movement to so-called decolonize history? Now, I know that you write about, um, you know, sort of old white men, and that's the kind of activist phrase today. You know, Second World War and all your books, the Russian Civil War and so on, focus on very much on Western slash Russian history. Um, and there, there is an argument from some academics and so on, a contemporary argument that says, well, no, no, you should really be focusing on um, other parts of the world and, you know, our contri contributions of straight white men and so on have been far overplayed and so on and things like that. So what do you make of that movement to decolonize? Well, I think it's absolutely right. And we have seen this change that um, we look at the world and look at history uh, in a far more global uh, way and I mean it was it was wrong the way that we were uh, or that I was sort of brought up when I say wrong I'm not saying necessarily morally wrong I think that it was historically wrong the way that we were always brought up with just the emphasis on British history and what Britain had achieved uh, in the world um, and I think it's far more important that one does understand it I mean the huge books which are all now world history you know whether it's uh, Seabag or um, Peter Frankopan and all these uh, they're looking at things very much more uh, in a purely in a, in a sort of global global way and one realizes and from that point of view you know what a very small part Europe really played I mean Europe actually played a huge part but uh, in in the great scheme of things we were uh, a very small part of the world and I think that it's corrected now sometimes the correction can go too far or it's overcorrects or whatever and we have to understand uh, British history as well and Britain's uh, place in the world during that particular period what we did right and what we did wrong and many of the things were wrong there's no doubt about it but I mean in comparison say to uh, other colonial histories um, you know, the, 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 some, were, some were quite a lot, probably a lot worse. Uh, but that's not necessarily the point. The point is actually to try to understand things from, on a much wider basis than we have in the past um, and actually see, in a way, how uh, the West actually um, is, may have had a disproportionate effect on world history in the past. But it's now we are seeing, shall we say, the decline of the West in terms of, not in the way necessarily that Spengler uh, predicted of the decline of the West, but we are very much seeing the decline of the West and the way that our role is going to diminish very rapidly, not just Britain, but obviously the whole of Europe as well, um, in proportion to uh, China, the United States and um, other parts of the world. Now, I suspect that there are some, you know, particularly Telegraph readers, who would say that um, these, some of these academics lack nuance. And certainly when they say that Britain had a unique evil role in history compared to other, let's say, empires and so on, you know, we're uniquely responsible for the slave trade, for example, they might say, or again, they'll talk about the Bengal famine and other, other sort of supposed atrocities that we committed. Um, you know, there's even some historians who say today that 
the British Empire was the equivalent of the Nazis morally. Um, what do you think of that? Do you think there is some? There, do you think there's a tendency by some to lack nuance because perhaps they're sort of they've got another lens of morality or politics lo- when looking at history? Well, it's ridiculous to start making comparisons with the Nazis, and I mean this is always one of the worst distortions of uh, distortions of history. I mean, you know that I mean, you know, it's it's I can't remember what, what the name of the thing is or whatever the law on the uh, internet that sort of as soon as an argument goes goes beyond beyond sort of four exchanges, then um, somebody is going to bring in Hitler. Um, I mean, all of that, of course, is 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 is, is ludicrous. Yes, of course, there's going to be a, a lack of nuance when you allow politics. Um, to take over history. By that I mean the duty of the historian is to understand. It's not to use it as a political uh, football weapon, whatever. Um, And to, with any luck, pass on that understanding. Now, the trouble is that um, obviously history can never be as certain European countries, and particularly sort of Germany and so forth, have tried to argue that you know that history is a science. History cannot be a science. It's a branch of literature, uh, so it cannot be completely objective. Now, historians should try and be as objective as, as they possibly can, and as I say, they should just try to understand and then to pass on that understanding. Now, that's not always not going, not necessarily going to be a, objective, um, but I think that one should make a very, very big effort to do so. Uh, and I always find, actually, that the most encouraging thing um, is when I've got, had a fixed idea about a subject I'm going to write on, um, that in the archives I then find that I'm totally wrong. Because that means I've actually found something quite interesting in the archives. And it is, it is worrying the way that many uh, sort of historians have moved into particular uh, areas. Um, because they've got a particular um, axe to grind, and um, military history, not surprisingly, is a very uh, controversial area. Um, and it's attracted uh, many out from outside who perhaps have uh, see things in, or they have a particular sort of political moral grid which they want to impose on the subject without actually trying to understand it properly first. Um, you know, if one's going to understand armies, you've got to understand how they work psychologically, how, uh, why they do things in particular ways. Um, you know, what is the point of Bernet tra- training? You know, um, it may look sort of, you know, ferocious and uh, dehumanizing and so forth. Um, actually, the reason, and the only reason for the Bernet uh, basically is so that, uh, if, say, if a soldier runs out of man- um, ammunition, he's not automatically going to panic because he's still got sort of something left. Well, I mean, we knew from the Second World War how few uh, Bernets uh, were responsible for killing um, the enemy. Very, very few indeed. Uh, but it was still an important part of training. But some historians will leap on that and try and sort of say, oh, that's uh, purely sort of because it's a... Uh, a sort of uh, form of mind washing or brainwashing, you know. Uh, you know, one's got to, I think one's got to, as I say, try to understand and um, then convey that understanding. Was it Napoleon who said something like, history is just a tale we tell ourselves or a story that's, that's basically been invented? Well, no, it's more than that. But I mean, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, sort of a, uh, a Napoleonic, shall we, sweep, sweeping, sweeping statement. But there is an element of the truth, of course, uh, but it's not the whole truth. Thank you very much, Anthony Beaver, for joining us. I really appreciate your time. Stephen, thanks so much.